Well, good evening, friends. And it's good to gather together in the Lord's name. We are not just here gathering together, but the Lord is amongst us. And his promise is to have his spirit with us wherever we are gathered together. We know that we're going to be uh, likely to be very short of numbers tonight, but it doesn't make any difference. The message is going out uh, far and wide, and that's the thing that we want. We could use technology that today we wouldn't have dreamt of 50 years ago. We thank God for this chapel that's been here all these years, and it has used whatever means it could to spread the word. And it is just so sad that the people round about, not just this village, but the town and most of the country, haven't got room for God. God has been left out of the equation, as it were. And there's coming a day when they will have to give account. But by the time they find out, most of them, it'll be too late. There'll be no changing paths then. And this is something which I have realised for a very long while. And tonight I want to touch on our first reading is from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, as you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. We praise the Lord for his precious word. Our second reading is from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 3. 
verses 7 to 15. Philippians 3, 7 to 15. <clears throat> but what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. <clears throat> Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Last time we looked at the question of, is there any hope? And in our world around us, it doesn't matter where about in the world you look, it's a relevant question. And be it in a place of relative peace, such as the British Isles, troubled largely as regards problems by things like knife crime and other things similar. But in some countries there is continual problem for the populations. In some, Christians are being persecuted actively. And if you are a true believer in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, you have to keep it quiet. Otherwise, you're just as likely to end up being dead. And it's a very, very difficult thing. And it is, to me, no good. We, in the relative of safety of the Western world, passing comments that they should stand up because their witness would be just snuffed out. It's as simple as that. We have to use godly wisdom. But the answer to the basic question of is there any hope is yes. But it is solely in Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah. Now, I frequently mention it in that context because so often people talk about Jesus or Jesus Christ. And some people may think that Christ is his name, but it isn't, it's his title. He is the Jewish Messiah. And the name Jesus itself is a variation from the Hebrew Yeshua. I would draw your attention to a passage which we haven't read, but I will read it to you. It's in the first letter of John in chapter 1. Verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. I'll just digress for a moment and just say that truth 
isn't some vague issue. It isn't just about telling the truth. The understanding amongst the Jews was more like a plumb line. It's what you are. Is the person true? Are they what they say they are? And that is the big question, and it still applies. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I read that passage to, as it were, set a scene. You see, with a salvation, a believer's salvation, there's no hit or miss about it. It isn't something vague. It isn't something, as it were, ethereal. It's a certainty. If you are born again, you are Christ. And if you are Christ, you are on a journey. And the title of tonight's talk is the path to glory. There are many people who describe themselves as Christians who do not have this certainty. They may be very regular church goers, but let me tell you that unless you are in Christ, that you are born again of the Spirit of God, you are a churchgoer and not a believer. It's as simple as that. There's no, if you like, religious veneer. It's a complete trust in the saving grace of Jesus Christ that makes us believers. The message that Jesus brought was simple and straightforward. And it can be encapsulated from what are in two verses. One is in Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. At the beginning of his ministry, he said to the people, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And the second one, probably not much later, was recorded in a, an exchange he had with a Pharisee who came to visit him one night by the name of Nicodemus. And we read about that in John's Gospel, chapter 3. And in chapter 3, verse 3, and chapter 3, verse 7, both of them say, you must be born again. There's no, it would be nice if you were, or God saying, I would like it. That is the definite thing about it. You must be born again to be in Christ. It's a definite thing. People who think that they can become Christians by just becoming familiar with a church service and the way things are done delude themselves. It is a personal commitment and it's essential 
that people understand that. And there is only one way, and that is through personal faith or personal trust in Jesus Christ's sacrificial atoning death on the cross of Calvary. But there's something else which, for people like me, who've been saved now for quite a few decades, we tend to forget that there are other people who haven't grasped certain basic truths. And one of the big problem ones is good works. And I want to emphasize this, not just by telling you, but by reading another scripture. And it's again a very well-known one. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9 and 10. And the Apostle Paul was addressing true believers, not churchgoers. He says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what does this mean? Well, we are saved not because of anything that we have done. We are the recipients of God's grace. And it is that alone and our accepting that Jesus Christ is the only one who could pay the penalty for our sin. Otherwise, we're paying it ourselves and hell is the destination. But he went to the cross of Calvary to pay my sin and your sin, and the sin of all believers. But not only that, Scripture tells us that this sacrifice was sufficient to cover the sins of all people. But I want to emphasize that it only takes effect when we own Jesus Christ as our own personal Saviour. There's no question about hanging on to somebody else's coattails in the family or anything like this. The old expression, we have to come to the foot of the cross individually. I had to. Every believer has to. It's as simple as that. The good works that are so often thought are necessary you will not ingratiate yourself with Almighty God with good works. And I say that not because I think that, but on the authority of what God's word says. The prophet Isaiah, quoting God, said, Our works are like filthy rags to him. That's what God thinks of our good works. There's only one thing can cleanse sin and get us onto this path, this journey into God's kingdom. And that is by accepting Jesus Christ as our saviour and accepting that his blood alone paid the price for our sin. There's one other thing I will make, and I'm going to single it out because it is a serious matter and has been going on for centuries. And that is the Roman Catholic Church has added to Scripture, which is forbidden three times in Scripture. You don't add or take anything away. You take what God has said, and that's it. And they have added a place called purgatory. Let me tell you something. I'm not being cruel. I'm not being unkind. I'm just telling you the truth. This purgatory is a figment 
of mankind's imaginations. There's no such place. You cannot work off your sins and curry favour with God. If we are believers, we have a different relationship, as it were, with our sins to the unbeliever. You see, my sins, past, present and future, were paid for on the cross of Calvary by Jesus Christ, and that applies to every believer. If I had to pay for one sin, hell would be the destination. Jesus has done it all. This is why our salvation is so great and so precious. There's nothing we can add to it, nothing we can take away. It is a simple one. You must be born again and accept that Jesus is the only way. Not only is this a lie, a figment of imagination of mankind, but it is a complete deception. You see, we should only trust God's word. People shouldn't trust my word, my opinions. I try and avoid giving them. Because, be quite blunt with you, Almighty God isn't interested in my opinions. So why should you? But his word is what he has said. And that is what should be understood, accepted and obeyed. The call of Jesus to Nicodemus was straight and to the point. You must be born again. Thankfully, Although we only hear of Nicodemus again at the time of the crucifixion, Nicodemus at some point had accepted Jesus Christ as his saviour and he was now a believer. So you'll see the passage we read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 to 10 explains it very clearly. Our salvation is by God's unmerited favour to us through fully trusting in him. But the important thing to realise is that coming to faith in Jesus Christ isn't the end of the thing. It's very Easy to see how somebody can say, well, I've passed from death to life. That's what the Bible says. That's it. Well, you're saved, but the journey, the Christian journey has just begun. You haven't arrived, you've just started. And it will go on until you leave this life. And the question is, What's it all about? And that is the path to glory. And I will say at the outset, I've never met anybody who can say that it's easy. Because once you are a believer, Satan, who was manipulating you, now... He's your out-and-out out enemy and doing everything he can to ruin your relationship with God. He knows he's his trouble. And I don't know if many people really have spent time thinking about Satan himself. I'm not talking making a doctrine out of it, but just thinking round the subject. And if I had to describe what he was like, I would say there has never in the whole of creation anybody who's been such a failure as Satan. Because every single thing that he has tried to derail God's plan of salvation, including trying to kill Jesus as a baby, 
interference at the time of the crucifixion, everything has gone wrong. And the Bible makes it quite clear that the lake of fire is where his destination is, together with the fallen angels. And secondly, it's worth mentioning, and scripture says this quite specifically, that the lake of fire was created for Satan and his angels, the fallen angels. It was never created for mankind. Mankind, when they fell, that's where they were going to have to go. But it was created for Satan and the, the fallen angels. Now, our journey as a believer on this path to glory will last, as I said, for the whole of our earthly life. And there may be some people who think that well, the Christian life should be easy. The answer is no. God wants us doing things. And there are two specific things that are mentioned in the passage we've read. One is concerning love for the brethren. And the other is to bear fruit. In other words, be productive in what we are doing for God whatever he has called us to do. And God expects us to grow in faith and maturity and to be holy or rather separate from the world in our whole life within the church, that's the body of believers, in the workplace, wherever we are, and to be people of integrity. And if anyone doesn't know what integrity is about, all I will say is read the book of Job. Sit down quietly. I know it's a fair length, but if you can, do it in one go. And you'll see there how God at the outset commended Job to Satan and said, there's nobody like him. His friends all pretty well thought that he must have done something terrible to deserve what he got, and it had nothing to do with that. His wife recognised he's got a problem and told him to curse God and die. And his reply was, oh, you're just talking like the silly women. But at the end, he actually says, I've maintained my integrity. He hadn't got everything right, but the integrity he had. The other thing is that in bearing fruit, it involves us working at it. It's not something that's just going to happen. We've got to be available for God, to allow God to work in us to bear that fruit bear fruit for him and to be his witnesses. In Matthew chapter 28, which is the last chapter of Matthew's Gospel, it says this, in the final words of Jesus in that Gospel, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That was the instruction from, direct from Jesus. So we've got our, our orders of what we're going to do. We read in that great commission by Jesus and the promise of his Holy Spirit who will be there the whole of our life. But there's no question of believers just standing still. We're on a journey. 
all of us. And a busy one. And the call is to abide in Jesus' love and bear fruit, which we read in John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 9 and 16. In Paul the Apostle's journeys, we find in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 23 to 28, he lists all the perils and dangers he's been in. And that's the sort of thing that can happen to us. But these are things which not only happen, but Satan will use to try and interfere in our relationship with God. And so we've got to be on our guard against what the enemy is doing. And as I said earlier about Satan's end, you can read about it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, where Satan is cast to join the false prophet and the Antichrist. There are some people who believe that uh, the lake of fire, they're associating it with a fire that we have. It destroys what's in there. The lake of fire is everlasting punishment. No, no end. It isn't annihilation. There are some people who teach that it is, but it is not. And you can look in Isaiah chapter 66, and it's the last verse of chapter 66. And three times we find in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 44, 46, and 48, in any translation which is based on the received text, such as the New King James or the Authorised, it says three times in that chapter, and their worm will never die. That doesn't sound like annihilation to me. But that is the situation. And so we move on to Philippians. And Philippians chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11 emphasize the importance of love and fruit on our journey in life. Paul regarded all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ his Lord. He counted them as rubbish. Why? That I may gain Christ and be found in him. And in verse 10 it says, that I may know him. And may I suggest that we must have, not just that it would be good to, but we must have that save, same commitment and drive that the Apostle Paul had. And whatever our age, whatever our length of time as a believer, we need to remember that in this life, we're just passing through. We're just passing through. Even this afternoon, I met a Christian brother and uh, they have a family pet, an unusual one. They got this pet when their son was a, a, a little child and it was a tortoise. The son is now 49. Tortoise is older than him. And he made a comment to me. He said, he'll outlive us. <laughs> They're very long lived, the tortoises. But the importance to God 
of being in the love of, of Christ and bearing fruit on our journey in life is very important. At the present time, as believers in the Western world, we've generally got a, a relatively easy time. But in lands where there is active persecution, the people there would be very easily identifying with the Apostle Paul, whatever the persecution was, because he knew it. Because it wasn't just natural phenomena that were involved. He was beaten with the rods. He had the 39 stripes. He was shipwrecked. It was a pretty, pretty bad time. And it was all done because he was in Christ. Being a disciple of Jesus is not intended to be an easy stroll through life. But as I've just mentioned, so many of our brethren in other lands know that discipleship comes at a great cost, personal cost. To the true believers, we are all engaged in spiritual warfare. And far from being a stroll in the park attitude, we are all soldiers in the Lord's army. And he provides the spiritual armour that we need. We read of in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. So this is what losing all to gain Christ is about. Always seeking a closer walk and maybe at a great cost. And the end of our journey is when we arrive in glory. And the end is a home in heaven with the Lord. And we read about that in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. But our journey which we're on now, is intended to be a busy one. It's not intended to be slack. The path to glory is not an easy one. It might sound short and sharp, loving the brethren, bearing fruit, but it demands application, persistence, keeping our eyes firmly on the Master. Alert to say Satan's schemes and losing all to gain Christ and finally a home in heaven with our Lord. The path to glory is to know him and to walk with him. And there's just a final thought. There are no shortcuts. <laughs> There are no little tricks that you can use. Jesus referred to the walk as being a tough track, as it were, compared with the motorway of life which the world is following. It's hard. You might get a ripped ankle. You might take a tumble. But you'll get there eventually. There are no shortcuts. And the certainty which we read of in 1 John chapter 1 and verses 5 to 10, which we looked at earlier. It is a serious matter. It is not an easy journey. But it is the journey we must take. Amen. Amen.